Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Thank you for joining today, this session on stories of resilience, lessons from local adaptation practice. This was a publication that we at the Global Center on Adaptation started as one of the activities of our global hub on locally led adaptation. So our first uh, book in the series was in 2022. And the objective really was to hear from practitioners of LLA on the ground on what the challenges were that they were facing, what the innovations they were bringing to deal with the impacts of climate change and what support they needed from local governments, national governments, and the global community at large. And the first publication that we did, in fact, was based on the Gobi Shona conference. So this was a collaboration with Salim and the ICAD team, where we said that we would take stories that were presented at Gobi Shona and develop them and, you know, sort of tell the whole story, include analysis, et cetera, which is what we ended up doing. Then last year, we partnered with CDKN, and uh, I'm sure all of you will know about CDKN, but Shenaz will introduce it in a minute as well. But um, and, and this time what we did was that we put out a call for partnership. So we asked local practitioners to write in to us and tell us about this, uh, the stories that they would like to share. And we had a tremendous response. We had about 200 people sending in uh, their stories and wanting to be included in the publication. And, uh, you know, a lot of them, they were really good stories. So we didn't want, we wanted to include as many as possible. And that task fell on Myri Dupar, who is with ODI and also with CDKN. So she had this very difficult task of trying to pull them all together. And so instead of like we did in the first time where we took one story and developed it and then looked at institutions and processes that enable locally led adaptation, et cetera, in this case, we decided to do it sectorally so we could include as many stories as possible. So it was a really intensive piece of work that Mari did. And I'd like to welcome her to come in and tell us uh, what the lessons were. I mean, the, the, the overall uh, uh, you know, picture that was emerging was quite clear, as you saw in the video, that the communities have no choice. They've got to adapt and they are innovating in, in their responses to the, the changing climate but the global and national systems are just not changing fast enough to respond to their needs. So Myri, over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew, and hi everyone. Lovely to see you today. Uh, so as Andrew said, the stories of resilience um, were gathered through this call for stories in May and June of last year, uh, targeting local adaptation champions, inviting them to tell their stories. And she's right, we've got over 200, close to um, 220, 225 responses from around the Global South. And um, I've just put again, the URL of where you can find the final report on there on the slide. Um, now, uh, the, the, having this many stories enabled us to really see what the trends were. Um, I'm trying to advance my slides there and hopefully um, that's working for you. Let me just um, try that again so that we can, we can, we can go rapidly through them. Um, you can put it on slide there. Yes, yes, yes I think that's just <laughs> taking a moment. There we go. Thank you for your patience. Um, so the top trends, they told us they were using their own labor, their in-kind materials to hand. This is really an overarching narrative about people getting on with adaptation, doing whatever they have with what's around them. Um, and the big trends we saw particularly were around protecting and restoring local ecosystems and really identifying those multi-dimensional benefits that ecosystem protection and restoration are delivering to communities, uh, particularly around food and water security and reducing the disaster risk from climate hazards. Also lots around creating local circular economies, removing harmful solid wastes which are often blocking water courses and making local flooding a lot worse when you have more intense rainfall but not just putting that waste somewhere else but actually putting it to economic use by reusing recycling and upcycling all in the context of course of generating local incomes and sustaining livelihoods so how are local communities going about this we saw a strong trend of intergenerational collaboration. We know that 
young people have been incredibly and very powerfully vocal on the international stage and on the national stage about their priorities for climate action, the imperative for urgent action. But what was so striking was how elderly people's associations, often retired folk, are getting very involved in locally led adaptation and reaching out and we see this collaboration across generations so um th there's not really friction we're seeing um so much working together across uh generations at local level and also this piece about local and indigenous knowledge for locally led adaptation um older and younger generations passing on information about appropriate indigenous plant varieties, growing techniques, water harvesting, um, which are more suited to uh, the variable climate conditions we're seeing, and also pilot testing new technologies um, in their particular local area. And that photo is showing a gentleman from Chiang Mai, Thailand, um, whose uh, older people's association has been uh, branching out into uh, sustainable biochar production and sharing that with younger farmers. Uh, we also see how integral the defense of rights is to locally led adaptation and where people's human rights are being eroded, where their environmental rights and rights to natural resources are being eroded, that is undermining their adaptive capacity and they are fighting back. Um, we see it and I think we'll hear more from today's speakers about um, women uh, really trying to secure the rights, the human rights of women and girls, including uh, working against violence and early forced marriage, which can um, be precipitated by climate shocks in their communities, and also the fight for indigenous and local people's rights over forests, over coastal resources, and so forth, indigenous lands. And Local groups are taking rights-based and holistic whole of person approaches. Um, we see how important uh, dealing with the psychological harms of climate change is at the local level. Again, our speaker, speakers will unpack that for you. Now, recommendations from a report, patient, predictable, responsive funding, which is one of the key principles of locally led adaptation, is so vital. But what needs to really change here? Because it's not getting down to community level. And um, the communities are saying, and, and we are uh, amplifying their voice, that funders need to change. They need to support work that is recognizing and enforcing local people's rights in the context of locally led adaptation. And they need to change their modalities uh, to make that funding more centralized and more accessible. Domestic law and policy, of course, plays an important part, including the need to govern and regulate transnational actors um, so that local people's rights, particularly over natural resources, are protected and that adaptive capacity is strengthened. And we see in countries like Kenya, where um, policies and budgets are now quite highly decentralized to the local level, to the county level, um, that uh, those local governments are managing to provide entry points for local adaptation champions and work together to be more responsive to sustainable ecological local priorities. And of course, the evaluation piece, um, evaluating adaptation progress, it needs to be people centred. I'll stop there, hand back to Anju and the community speakers. Thank you. You are muted, ma'am. You are muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for that, Mari. And we are lucky to have some of the LLA practitioners with us whose work has been represented in the, the publication. But I think, um, you know, it, it, it's one of the messages that comes out really quite clearly is that on the one hand, adaptation is a, an additional uh, burden on, on these communities. But on the other hand, the, it, the extent to which it's already sort of worsening existing situations, like where there, there's a, a rights don't exist, et cetera, it becomes very difficult to make these kind of arguments for adaptational rationales, et cetera. 
So uh, there's a lot of flexibility needed in how we define resilience to climate change. But now we have actually, um, one of the things that we, we tried to bring out in the report that isn't often talked about is the um, psychological impacts of climate change, loss and damage, right? So um, we have with us Nelson Chege, who's the deputy director of the Central Menti Environmental Rehabilitation Program in Kenya, who is going to tell us about the work his organization has been doing in um, taking a more holistic approach to climate impacts that Mari talked about. Nelson, thank you so much for joining us today and over to you. Yes, hi, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, my name is Nelson Chege. Um, I'm really glad to see very familiar faces here. It's been a minute. And um, as, as Andrew has mentioned, my name is Nelson Chege from, from Kenya, and I am the vice chair of a group called the Central um, Emergency Environmental uh, Rehabilitation Program. Uh, this is a group that was formed in 2009 by a group of women who came together to try and find a way to get the best from the environment. So they came together and um, try and get um, some, seek some sort of income generation as, as women and help each other through community farming and ecological restoration. So they began engaging in activities like uh, planting fruit, fruit trees and uh, keeping bees and basically uh, setting up uh, seedlings and trees that will help them. So um, the group was set up in 2009 by uh, mostly aging women. And at some point there, there was a bit of a decline because of the age, unfortunately. So eventually they came down to uh, their children and grandchildren who are mostly young people. And the aspect now, the idea that came in was bringing an aspect of intergenerational collaboration when it comes to issues of ecological restoration. The younger generation came in with uh, fresh ideas on climate change because they understood how climate impacts their society. And they also want to um, kind of continue the kind of work has been done by the older generation. So we, we were able to uh, work with the, the older generation where we were able to begin harnessing local knowledge on issues like indigenous plants and how to stop soil erosion, what kind of plants we can use, uh, the community around that can use to stop soil erosion and also to restore um, an ailing um, environment because there's a lot of loss of, of the, basically the, the, the local trees and local um, Situation. So, um, so through uh, this uh, this group of young people, we were able to bring in aspects of education. So we came in and uh, went into the, into the community and brought in aspects of um, education, especially on climate change, because the people understood what climate change was, but not really did not understand the technical aspects of it. So we were able to um, approach them in, on um, teaching them what climate change is and how they can also work to help the environment and also be able to earn a living from the environment. So we're also able to translate local policies, like help them understand what kind of policies at county level, at national level, and how that affects them and how they can be able to basically understand local laws and how they'll be able to gain from that. So one of the ways the younger generation came in into this group was they realized there's a psychological aspect, there's a psychosocial aspect of climate change and how it affects this community. So there's a realization that as um, issues of drought came in, issues of excess rainfall, there was a lot of loss of arable land, there's a lot of loss of li livelihoods, um, there was issues of animals dying out because of drought, and the men at some point will, lo will lose their way of income and the women were left at home suffering. So as we tried to align ourselves with the, um, the younger generation and older generation, we, we worked, uh, we joined a group called the Stronger Project. It's a, it's a youth-led organization on mental, on mental wellness and Psychological, psychological support. So the idea here was to go to down to the ground and speak to these people and trying to understand what exactly um, the climate issues affecting them and how, uh, how exactly they can, uh, we can help each other to, um, to grow. One of the ways uh, we were able to do this is um, the Stronger Project together with the Central Inventor, um, you mentioned the environmental program, was able to run a pro a programs on open dialogue. So basically sit down with the locals and ask them what, how climate, um, climate change has impacted them, um, the kind of solutions that they have, and the issues of climate shock and, and um, the issues of climate shock that affect them and kind of the solutions that they have. So we were able to try and stigmatize issues of mental health and through collaborative di di dialogue, we are able to link, um, direct, directly link climate, uh, climate issues and mental health issues. 
And that's where we were able to collect solutions from the locals. And they are very innovative solutions where they will suggest, um, as I mentioned, the um, aspects of beekeeping, those um, aspects of planting trees and coming together. There was a lot of uh, local solutions that um, external parties not have been able to bring within that community. So the organization grew. It's, uh, we were able to target um, multiple groups in local churches, women, women's group, and youth, youth organizations. So th through that way, we were able to also encourage selling of seedlings, of seedlings and also be, uh, be able to allow people to get an income from their own environment. So the, um, the program has been able to grow, and we've been able to uh, find a, a lot of um, basically lessons from uh, this interaction with the local organization, uh, the local community. One of them was um, locally led adaptation should be more holistic. So there's a lot of concentration on finding basically the environmental aspect of, uh, of adaptation and climate. If you forget these, um, these other markers of, of um, adaptation and um, climate impact, and none of them realize it's like a social awareness. There's a need to uh, not concentrate basically on just climate, uh, climate change. You need to understand that um, the, the well being of the people needs to, to, um, to be prioritized also. Uh, when also, when it comes to finding, we also realize that there are issues of fault migration, there's a social dynamics of a community, and the solutions that are, that are the, um, the issues that affect us as such a, a community can only be resolved by the community themselves. So there's a, there's a need for a sense of ownership in these programs. So we, we were also able to look on issues of uh, using lived experiences when it comes to guiding such projects. So we will, uh, one of the ways we've been doing this is use storytelling as a way of, of collecting data. So we'll go on the ground and talk to the people. And through a very informal interaction, we get their solutions and ideas of how they can be able to support their own, their own communities. And this, we've been able to learn that there's an overly use of um, very structured data on, when, when it comes to um, data collection, a very structured um, format of data collection. And this has been able to lock out very many communities who have the solutions and they're not able to access information on grants, on issue, uh, information on, on the kind of lived experiences they have, they are able to um, explain that to the people who really matter because they don't have access to such uh, these formal data collection processes. So one of the ways we've done that is storytelling. Um, another um, learning lesson we got was the need to support um, financial literacy and education, where communities, um, 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 local governments and NGOs and everybody's trying to help communities are supposed to, uh, should, uh, should come and, um, sorry, oh yes, should encourage financial literacy when it comes to these projects. When it comes to grant making processes, there's a lot of issues of uh, communities being taken advantage of because of a lack of awareness. So instead of having a very a singular approach to locally led adaptation and support, there's a need to have a more holistic uh, approach to this kind of support. Those were some of the lessons and um, issues we've been able to understand from the Central Mentee Environmental Program. And we are really grateful for a chance to um, express our lessons and um, understanding, and understanding this throughout this process. So I'm uh, sure there'll be a few questions afterwards, but that is the gist of it. Thank you. Thank you, Nestle. Thanks for that. We actually have two questions from Vincent. The first one, uh, uh, Chenaz, I'm going to put you on notice if we can sort of discuss that and I'll also add in my bit. I see Myri's already responded. It. But um, the second one, Nelson, is for you. How do these impressive local examples of local adaptation tie into national priorities and government of Kenya's support at local and national level? Are the communities linked to the county climate change fund allocations? So I, in our experience, because I believe um, we have very many groups doing the same things that we're doing. So in our experience, uh, one of the issues that we've faced is uh, most of the projects that have been funded right now are those that we need to, they, there's a need to prove immediate scale. So um, access is very limited for smaller groups like ours. We keep being, uh, get, uh, getting feedback, our group is too small. We need to um, scale it, but it's not possible to scale it without the support that we actually need. So um, access to this kind of funds is limited, even at national and county level, because we've been are they, are they are asking for, fun, um, for scalability first, and then they are able to fund us. So it's very limited funding. I'm not sure if that was the question. 
I think that was a point that came through the report that often these kind of initiatives are too small, right? So it's it's not, I mean, you yes. don't have access to the bigger funds, but then sometimes you also don't have access to funds available at the national level. So yes. yeah, thanks for that, Nelson. I mean, uh, what you said and what we'll hear from our next speaker, what Mary said was that a lot of the initiatives that we heard from were about ecological restoration. And I think that's hardly surprising given that vulnerable communities around the world are so heavily dependent on natural resources for their lives and livelihoods. So, um, and and what was also interesting is it, I think it's, it's, it has been clear for a long time, it's becoming clearer that these communities also have a really critical role to play in ecological regeneration. And that often there are, you know, this can be, we talk about the private sector, but we don't think about sort of private sector initiatives in uh, at this very local context where communities themselves become uh, uh, private sector enterprises. And our next speaker is going to talk to you about that. It's Constance Okolet, the chairman of the Osukuru United Women's Network from Uganda. Constance, are you online? You hear me? We, we you hear, hear you. me? Yes, we hear you, but we don't see you. But that's fine. If, if you uh, don't worry, don't worry. Me, I see you. Don't worry about seeing me. <laughs> <Go ahead>. <laughs> <laughs> My network is not good. <laughs> uh, you get me? Hello. We hear you clearly, Constance. Sorry. Okay, okay, okay. I am Constance Okolate from Tororo. I am the chairperson of Osukru United Women Network. Actually, the network is a, was formed to talk for the voiceless. It's a platform for the voiceless because it's like with the women in the village are the women who are suffering. We don't know what is happening. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to get what we can get out of the gardens, out of the, out of the seasons as we used to get uh, out of, uh, 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 how to help our homes, how to help our children, where is the next generation? So we have so many questions to answer and so many questions that we cannot answer. Then we said, let us come together. Let us be one. Let us come and uh, make up this platform and talk. And those people who cannot talk can do what? Can come to the platform and talk their issues and we can push it up. And that's why the platform was formed. The platform was formed in 2000. So much floods everywhere, everywhere. All our, almost all our homes were flooded and we don't have to, we, we couldn't eat, we couldn't sleep. You are just on water. You couldn't move to the next village. The children could not go to school. Hospitals were full, early marriages were there. So many issues came up that time. And at the end of the day, we saw that things are not on our side and we said, let this platform be. And then we started the platform. Now, the issue of, uh, the issue of uh, food security, we started, how are we going to eat? There was no food to eat. Then we sat down, after sitting down, we said, it is our problem. Our problem, we cut trees. Our problem, we destroy the young trees that is coming up. What should we do? Let us begin by planting trees. We plant any tree that comes up, you plant food trees, you plant timber trees, you plant anything that is called a tree to have the cover. Because our belief is that with the trees, there shall be rain and the rain will give us the what? 
uh, no more rain and they shall give us water to dig and we get out the foods. Now, without the, 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 the water, the food cannot come. Without the water, we cannot have water to drink because during the time of floods, it's floods, everything is contaminated. And during the time of the drought, everything is dry, no water, no what, no food. A person eats uh, at one time a day or takes porridge and sleeps. No food for the children. You find children very pale no, and very sick. The hospital is full. So we said, no, this can't work. Let us begin. We began. We began going door to door during home improvement campaigns. Because door to door, a person will understand. Then after a person understanding, will know that what we are talking is right. And people embraced it. People started it. People started moving. People started planting trees. We started making nursery beds. People started planting trees. We started now, we say, okay, let us do, is, do it as a business. We started selling. We sold the trees. We sold the, the tree seedlings. Now there are some groups who are just specialists in the tree seedling raising because we want the whole, the, the, the whole, like your home is covered with the trees. Why can't it be covered with the trees at the boundaries? Then we started at the boundaries. So you find that things are moving slowly, slowly, slowly. Actually, we didn't know that why is this thing. Instead, we are blaming ourselves. But one day, one time, I was called for a meeting in, a, in a, our city about climate change. That's where I came to know that because of overpollution, because of uh, many factories in the world, that's why things are changing to the worst. Actually, we are suffering. With the women in the communities are suffering. We don't know what to do, but we are praying that if all goes well, if we can get funds to have other alternative uh, actions to be done on the ground, it would help us. Now, when we look at other alternative actions, that is maybe piggery, that is poultry, that is a, maybe irrigation systems to be put in place so that we can have a better living than what we are, the, the life that we are leading now. We are leading a very hard life that one cannot have it. Because if you look at the 24 hour clock of an, uh, a community woman, you have to wake up in the night, that is uh, five o'clock, go to the garden, come back, prepare, do that, everything, then you come up to one, that's lunchtime. Then after one, you have to wash, you have to fetch water, you have to look for firewood, you have to do that. Then after that, then there's no rest. Now from there, you have to prepare for tomorrow. A woman rests, uh, for our community, according to our study, a woman rests only for four hours, only for four hours. Then there we grow very old quickly, loss of brain remembrance. So, so many sicknesses come in because of the workload we are having. How about the next generation? The next generation, we are trying to fight for the next generation so that we can have them. They help us to plant more trees, plant the more, more foods so that we can have foods in the gardens, so that we can have the trees planted around the homes, the mangoes, the avocados, the what, so that people can eat. During dry season, children can eat and drink water because the season now is, is not there. We don't have any season. We used to have the indigenous knowledge. The indigenous knowledge is not there. We are not, it is not helping us now because now they brought in their science, the science is not helping us. Though we are still using our indigenous knowledge on, 
on the seasons to come. Now, we used to have two seasons in a year, which is not there now. These days, we just gamble with agriculture. You plant when you see it rains, plant. If it shines, stop. <laughs> so it's a bit difficult to understand which situation a person should live in. That's why we are still saying, where are we and what are we to do? Where are the people who are coming to help us? Like of recent when uh, CDKN took me, CDKN and the South South North took me to, to Dubai. When I came back, everybody was asking me, uh, are they coming for our rescue? Are they coming to help us? You are there, what did you tell them? I told them, I told them the story about how we are living. So are they coming to bring for us other projects that we can that can help us? Because the, the little savings that we do is not enough for everybody. Because we are we do savings and credit. Now the savings and credit, a person maybe saves like a quarter dollar, I, I think, every week. And now it is not enough for the whole circle to run and to get money and to do business. So it's a bit hard for us, the women in the community, though the men are now also joining us and we are now having one voice. When we go to the district, we want the seeds. The seeds are not there. They say there is no money. When you go to the, maybe to the sub county, you say you will want to help us with seeds. The quick maturing seeds is not there. We, there is no way of how can you get the money to buy the seeds. So it's a bit a, a tricky situation or living in our communities. But fortunately, everybody is now embracing what we are doing. In every home, every season, every rainy season, you find people planting trees in every home. In every home you go, you will find the, the clean energy. This is the cook stove that is used, used, used what? The locally available materials is, is there. Then when you go, you will find pit latrines. Pit latrines, used not to be there. So those things are there. We are now using the briquettes. The briquettes we make, we model it, we use it for cooking. So we have to look those, for those cheaper ways of cooking other than the three stones that we used to have. And it is very expensive. It uses much firewood and where to get firewood is not there. We used to travel very long to look for firewood. We used to travel very long to look for, for water. But now all those, we've brought it nearer to the community by awareness creation, sensitization. We mobilize them. We talk about climate change. Though most people didn't know about climate change, but they are now coming to learn about it, that it is not our making, but we should try and stop it. Even if we don't stop it, we change it. Even if we don't change it fully, we make it a bit better than the situation that people were, use, were living. People used to live a very good life. When I was growing up, I'm now 60 years. When I was growing up, I grew up in a very simple, easy life. Not now. Now every problem is there. Everything is there. Every, but those days I didn't see these floods, the drought, the what we used to have all types of foods in the in the in the granary, in the kitchen. You come back from school, you eat what you want. We used to have animals, you take milk. You used to have that granary of sim sim granites, what you eat. But these days, nothing. And I think that's why there's a lot of sickness coming in because of this climate change. Thank you very much, CDK. Thank you very much, SSN, for this invitation. Greetings to all.
Thank you, Constance. Thank you for your presentation. I think, I mean, what you've also made clear is that uh, it's the sort of networks that you create with the communities that are perhaps of most support and help to you, like your own network. I wonder, Constance, if you want to come back to one of the questions that we had of um, what are the kind of problems that you face in accessing funds that are available either at the government level or specific climate change funds? I, I, you speak about that, members of your network speak about that on in the story. Would you like to just quickly come back on that? Mm, yeah. Now, my our problem, accessing funds, like for the Climate Change Fund, our problem is, uh, first of all, we are community members and very far from the central. And most of these funds end up in the central. By the time it reaches us here at the districts, you will find that it is very small. And the country is also and that most of the money is we just hearing and we don't get it. There is climate change fund, there is smart agriculture, there is what? When I was in COP, like it was like sounding like ah, tomorrow I'm going to get that money in my community. So for us, when we are in the community, we get no money. And that's why we say, let us see how we can do by ourselves by savings, after savings, we loan out small, small, and we can help ourselves instead of sitting and waiting and crying for what is not there. The person who will now think that we are there can come and help us. Now at the district, it's not a bit difficult, but they don't give you money. The district, they gave us a project of, um, a grinding mill, a processing machine. But they don't give you all, they give you some things. Like they gave us a house and they stop there. They don't give power, they don't give water. So all those monies, the women have to struggle and they collect and, but with the, the meager resources that a woman has or the little money a woman saves, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to have everything uh put on a, put it put it right like the machine is there no power no water but the machine is there the government gave us all we got it through the district because the, we are registered up to the district and the district now knows us and that's why they say let us give them a processing machine now another way of getting money is difficult because most funders want paper, paperwork. For us, we do our paperwork on our small papers, our books, but for them, they complicate matters by putting in uh, those strong English, those requirements that a local woman cannot get. And they think that the woman in the community does not know how to use money. And yet that woman in the community can use money better than that person in the other office. Why am I saying so? Because the little money that we save and take, that when a woman gets, a woman puts it into proper use. A woman will say, I want to buy uniform. A woman will say, I want to buy books for my children. A woman will say, I want to buy a pen and she will implement what is she called that money for. But for, in most cases, the funders think that these women don't know how to use money, don't know how to account for the money. Maybe how they don't know, maybe they even don't want the money. <laughs> but uh, I think, I think that is that, but uh, it's not, not easy to get money from those uh, funders. So Constance, there's somebody, uh, Vincent again has pointed out in the chat that the government of Uganda has committed under the, the Life AR program that at least 70% of the money they get for climate change will be sent to the local level by 2030. Is this something that is well known? In, is this something that your network is aware of? 
about the money money to be got so they say that most of the money that they get for climate finance will be sent mm. to the local level that's a commitment by the government of uganda mm. yeah they do they do but uh like for, for like for this case uh as i said the country is big they go to north mm -hmm. they like going to north because the north was uh, affected by the what north was affected by the by the what by the war mm -hmm. then after that the 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 what the then the west the western is for the western is for for the what for their i don't know they like those two areas but uh, yeah. it comes it goes to those communities but not in my area as we are here we are struggling and we don't see those funds yeah but I hope by 2030, it will be there. That is the commitment that by 2030, 70% will flow to the local level. Uh, uh, Thank you, Constance. Maybe. I hope you stay because I'm sure there'll be a discussion at the end. But, yeah. Yeah. Now we're joined by Alan Taman, who is the chairman of the Santo Sunset Environment Network. And I see that there was a comment already on the role of indigenous knowledge and uh, in natural resource management, etc. Alan, are you are you here? Are you with us? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, um, Alan, I mean, what was, uh, sorry, what was really inspiring from your story also was the collaborations across generation, and how you're managing to merge both indigenous knowledge and uh, modern scientific knowledge, right? So really eager to hear from you. Over to you, Alan. Thank you. Yes, um, as um, some already introduced me, yes, I'm uh, the chairman of uh, Santo Sunset Environment Network, the indigenous, uh, led by indigenous people in Vanuatu. In the small island called Vanuatu near to Australia, New Zealand, the South Pacific. Um, we are working especially based in the community level. And um, we we set up since um, 2017, just because um, our, our, our areas in Western Sando is uh, one of the remote areas in Vanuatu and we don't have any bank. Uh, we don't have any uh, visual road and uh, no um, electricity. Um, um, we travel only by boat and um, somehow the, the, the development of the, the, the government projects that runs down and it stops somewhere and it uh, can't reach our people and we, the community in the full Western Santo, as we have uh, 42 communities and we have 5,000 plus people. We came together and we have to discuss around um, why we should uh, work or why we should implement um, some of the projects or how we should help us in our communities to, um, to become the same level to the another part of the, of the country. So, so we set up this um, uh, network and the network was uh, working very well with the communities and um, all of the communities, like we say all of the part of the areas, they um, um, really appreciate what the network was doing. We also um, are working together with the uh, women, uh, youth and uh, the chiefs. And we, 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 we with with trying to help people doing more and more awareness about the climate change uh, because people they can do something if they understand something um so 
um, first thing of, yes, first thing we, we are working with the communities is we do awareness first. We do awareness, we, we try to explain to the uh, people in the communities to know uh, what is climate change and what we, 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 we do to like we do something to, to adaptation and show them the real impact of the climate that affecting the communities. And all the people in the communities, they are aware or they understand what is climate change and they see the real impact that affecting people. And then they, all of the people, they uh, cooperate together to do something out to be to to be resilient or uh, to to do some adaptation or innovation as we are, are trying to to implement. Yes, we the first thing is we we we, we do some conservation areas in um, in terms of like um, trees absorb the carbon, so it helps to because we all know that. The climate change is something to do with carbons in the air. So um, we, we must do some conservation in our forests. And then um, because trees help us to, to observe the carbon, to absorb, sorry, to absorb the carbon and it trying to, um, uh, let's say, uh, absorb the carbon to, 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 to uh, like uh, reducing the amount of the carbon. So people, they have conservation areas and the network help them to do the management plan. And um, when we uh, talk about conservation areas and we try to help the people that, um, we try to help the people that instead of, instead of cleaning the big areas, instead of cleaning up the big forest to, plan um, something, plan food, we, we, we do some backyard gardening. We do some backyard gardening in the uh, communities and we can, um, even though it's a small area, but you can eat and your, 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 your son can eat inside that areas and your, um, your generation will continue eat in the same land in the small, just only a small backyard gardening. So we train people and we do backyard gardening in the communities. And also we do, um, um, we set up the city triple C, C CTCC means um, Community Disaster Climate Change Committee. We set up in every community, they had a committee and structures of that committee uh, links with the national government. And um, now, the city triple C are working in their areas in terms of impacts of climate change and uh, working in, the, in, in, in one of the communities, like uh, we have 42 communities, everyone, and then we have one each of the community inside the communities, and they are doing some things like doing adaptation. If the committee had a plan, they had an action plan, and they um, when they see something affecting, or like we say, swell erosion or landslide. So uh, they just talk to the communities and they do something, plant trees, uh, plant one of the crust that we call Fediva grass. They plant across the um, the swell erosion or the landslide so it holds fast the, the, the flooding or the swell erosion. And they can do something. So um, uh, that, that structures that co comes from the national government and to the provincial government and to the village level is we have three um, uh, uh, three scenarios. Three scenarios, it means that um, if um, there's some impact that needs only the community to um, adapt or to fix it, so the community will fix that um, um that impact or that they, they add up with that um, impact of climate change. But if it's for the provincial government, so the community uh, city triple C, they um, report to the provincial government, local government and to the provincial and they can come to, uh, to, um, um, to, to respond 
in that um, impact. But if it's come to, because you know, in our countries, we, we call tropical cyclone. If it's a tropical cyclone, they, when, when it hits our, um, our, um, as, uh, our, 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 our community, so our country with category five, it, it, it like we, we, we are in teacher status, yes. So that structure will, if we can meet the national government and the, um, to come down and help, so the, yes, that's all about the three scenarios that I'm talking about. So, but uh, what uh, Santo Sunset are doing in our areas is we, we do some nursery plants and we held uh, the, the summit and um, we come to talk about the issues of climate change and the importance of the um, um, adaptation or innovation. And we come up to one of the uh, resolution that the chief sign and uh, um, the, the women leaders and the uh, youth leaders, they shine in the, in the um, uh, resolution that uh, in an area we stop the commercial locking and the selling of lands. And um, number three is um, no mining. So in our areas now with the, the resolution present to the provincial government and to the national government that in our areas, we stop commercial locking, no mining, no selling of land in our areas. Because, you know, if we sell land to the other a man or other, like the man owns that he, he buy the land and he owns that land and then he, he can do what he want. If, if it's a, um, he, he wanted to mining or what, so he can do. So we stop that and we stop commercial locking and we stop selling of land. So the, what we are working here is like, we are doing, um, try to adapt in this time of climate change. We held one a mini agriculture show that takes all of the communities to come together and um, take their uh, crops in the garden to showcase it. And we partner with the national government in the Department of Agriculture to um, come down and explain some uh, a resilient plant and distribute some resilient plant to the communities in times of disaster or in times of drought or in times of rainy. Um, you know, some of the food uh, uh, now is like, um, it, it not the time to harvest, but you, you see something problem in your garden and now you are thinking why? So they are explaining that no, because it's too much rain and then it goes, the early harvest, but it's not the time to harvest. And now we have to combine or we have to marry the um, traditional um, traditional uh, uh, agriculture with the modern agriculture to have our food security or we, we can have food security. And um, yeah, we, we, we do um, some documents inside the traditional knowledge um, traditional knowledge to 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 help people out in the very very remote areas to um, to become resilient just only uh, true in our, our traditional ways. You know, um, if example, if one of the not not example, but it's a real example that uh, one of the category five cyclone that hits uh, our communities and some of uh, the permanent building uh, are flown out, but the traditional building, they are, all people are safe there. And before waiting, waiting for the relief to come, all people in the communities, they already built up their shelters and they are waiting, living inside the shelters and waiting for the, uh, we can say, the dry ration or the import the food. But if we talk about the shelter in a traditional in traditional ways uh, um, people their life or the, the livelihood is depending uh, in the environment or in the forest because once when uh, the cyclone strike um, 
every uh, yes well, after the cyclone strike uh, people they have lost or their shelter have flown they just go back to the bush or to the forest and cut trees cut some ropes cut some leaves and come back and build their shelters while waiting for the dry ration to import or to be reach the the, the communities yes i think um i, I stopped there but um our um, uh, we, we are facing, really facing now the impact as we are um, speaking. We are now yet in the um, a season of cyclone in Vanuatu. Um, maybe we are expecting depression uh, now. But yes, last thing is like, um, we, um, I don't want to take too much time. But last thing is, um, you know, uh, in the first place, I said there's no communication. Like we have some internet that it's not strong so we were partner with it with uh, one of the trilling internet here in Vanuatu and um, uh, trilling internet here it's it's part of the like in Kashivik and we have we, we're buying the, the satellite this and uh, put um, all those um, this in the communities for them and train them Train, we call the ranger. We train all the rangers and city triple C, and we train them how to use the internet or some app inside the uh, tablets or the smartphone to to see where the the weather is and where is the direction of the cyclone and uh, how to give the warning when they see that in the in the smartphone and they can. Um, tell the communities that oh we we have one cyclone one dispersion in that place because we, they had um uh internet in place and um we 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 train all the the women's and peoples how to do the sustainable to, like we say sustainable business so we plant trees and one of the trees that we it's it's useful to plant it in the sea coast and in the in the uh, papa zone of the river, um, we we plant pantanas. That's called pantanas. And then out of that pantanas, um, the women take out the leaves and um, uh, dry it up, and they do handicrafts weaving, like they weave baskets, hand fan, uh, anything they want to weave it, and they can uh, earn money out of it again. So the tree. It still continue to grow, but yet it gives money to the women to show to 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 help the livelihoods to grow. And um, we say we 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 set up some uh, savings and we call savings and loan or savings to for them to only save their money, and out of that money they can um they can use it in times of uh, disaster or in times of we can do some adaptation in the in, in in some of the impacts that are affecting us yes i think um uh, that's all for to say if uh, there's any question you can ask but if not uh, thank you very much for the invitation thank you thank you alan that was really great to hear about uh, first of all how you're merging international uh, indigenous and traditional knowledge but um I mean, how also you find that some of the old ways are more resilient. I mean, there's clearly a reason that the houses were built in that way, right? So thank you for sharing. And I hope you can stay on as well if you have time for questions at the end. We we have another contributor to the publication, Oscar Ryan Uma from Busia County in Kenya. Uh, Oscar, we'd be really uh, pleased if you could say a few words. No problem. It's nice, nice to have me here today. I'm um, Oscar. I, I think everyone can hear me, right? Clearly, yes. Go ahead. Yes, I'm Oscar Ryan Oma from Busia. Uh, I'm the founder of Kenge Content Live Organization, and it's a registered youth-led nonprofit organization. And uh, I'm pleased to be part of. Uh, those who are working towards uh, solutions to the current global challenges facing us. And uh, going to our story, our organization was founded in 2020. And it was founded uh, after 
I personally felt an ecological grief seeing uh, our surrounding changing uh, before my eyes. And uh, the story from uh, Constance from Uganda really resonates with our community because uh, when I was a kid, we used to have abundant uh, food stored in our granaries. When I was a small boy, uh, we used to have foods. Our grandmothers and fathers used to predict the rainfall and it never failed they will predict they plant and they get uh, they get grains uh, to feed us but over time as we've been growing things have been changing and uh, so in 2020 i choose i opted to just uh, think like is this the right the right way we used never to have these hot uh, temperatures like we have right now so that uh, thinking uh, made me start asking our colleagues my younger peers and also engage our older mothers and fathers. And uh, they could really agree that uh, long before we are born, our, our community is surrounded with hills. We, I, I come along the shores of Lake Victoria. So we have hills and uh, forests. So uh, they say our hills had abundant uh, trees, but over time we've cut down trees to burn charcoal because uh, they burn because they don't have uh, money to feed the, the families. They encroached the fragile lands. And so we've caused this damage. And these are the, the impacts we are feeling, the effects now. So he said, no, we should uh, come up with something. And I founded the uh, Kenke content type. And uh, since then, we planted uh, over 20,000 trees. We engage women and uh, women and youth majorly because uh, we believe like in this case women i think we've lost oscar oscar can you hear us in our community are the ones who you can hear now you're back yeah you, you dropped yeah. off for a while as i was saying it's them it's women who make our rural life lively and so uh, we usually see the need to put them as a part and parcel of our programs during our tree planting we usually engage women. We also uh, do programs related to education, climate awareness. Many of our youths did drop out of school to go for early fishing, and that's a big challenge. So we usually make sure that uh, we tail our education programs in a locally accessible manner, in this case in our local dialect language, so that uh, even those who didn't go to school, even those who didn't drop out of school, be part and parcel of uh, the solutions to what we want to achieve. So our climate action uh, programs usually make sure that even uh, those who did drop out of school are part of uh, our programs. And since over time, I think uh, we are seeing some good improvement. We aren't still there because uh, we are struggling with funds. We usually have projects, but we can't uh, implement because of funds. But uh, over time, I'm sure we shall uh, be part and parcel of uh, the climate adaptation and mitigation uh, team that uh, will face the next generation and say we did a good job and now we have a climate stable world. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar, for stepping in at the last minute and sharing. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah it, it's really quite clear that there are so many small organizations that just slip through the works, right? They have no access to funding whatsoever. So that, uh, somebody has put in a plug for a session later on in Gobishona today where they will discuss this issue. So I think it, it's worth attending that. I'd now like to invite Dr. Shehnaz Musa, who's the CEO of CDKN, for her reflections on the inputs from practitioners. Shehnaz, are you there? I'm here, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I? Yes, so I'll go. Um, so firstly, to thank the, the practitioners who were chatting now, because first of all, 
I mean, if we just looked at Constance, it's a mission to actually just get stable Wi-Fi and to dial in. And for us, it's so easy to say we're having this webinar, can you join? So um, the stories are so important because if we look at them and try to draw out the patterns within them, I think it is really, really clear that we're dealing with complex and embedded systems, right? So for example, adaptation has been happening. People have been responding. Otherwise, none of us would be here. And to think that we can now come in and decide what adaptation responses must look like, et cetera, et cetera, is completely naive. I think we need to also shift the narrative a bit, not around what can the, like how can the communities be capacitated to access finance, but the other way around. How do we change the finance architecture so that it can easily to respond to the local needs on the ground? And for ex example, because it's local climate action, it's local led, doing things like um, often you often you get told you must go out to scale. Why? Because it makes sense for the funders, not for those implementing it on the ground. During COVID, as and I just want to use an example, we did a study that looked at how a community is responding to the COVID crisis because highly likely it's going to be a similar way they respond to the climate emergency. And it's exactly that. The women are responding with their own resources. The youth are responding. There's intergenerational collaboration. And I often wonder why is this so surprising? Because that is how local communities work when there's limited resources. And for me, it's about the global north understanding that that's actually how communities work and how do we capacitate ourselves in the global north to work with them. And so, I mean, that's the one extreme, but I do feel that it doesn't all sit with the local communities. And often there's this thing about the money is going to local government, I mean, to government, how is it flowing down to the local communities? Most cases it doesn't. That's the reality. Because if you look at the powers and functions at local government, there's mandates for this, mandates for that. Often the local communities get lost. The money goes somewhere, but not to the lo local communities. Um, so I'd like to, again, thank our practitioners for sharing their stories with us, because I think for us, it's a privilege to hear them. And it's a privilege that you are prepared to come to this forum for and speak to us. So thank you to you. And for, for ourselves, I'd like to challenge us to um, maybe start talking out of our echo chambers, because we all know about climate change. We all, like, like, we are the financiers in these conversations. We are the engineers who have to implement. Like, so to broaden our, um, let's start engaging the not the usual suspects. And let's start challenging the status quos. Um, yes, Andrew, that, that, that's from me. And, and there were quite a few questions, which again, were around how we're getting money to the local, like, like for example, through the Life AR, money is being, there's a commitment from government to get the money to the communities. How often in reality do those commitments actually end up with implementation? And I think those are the sorts of questions that need challenging. And there's enough data to support that and say, okay, is this the way to go? What is the data saying? And so on. So thank you, Anju, for giving me the space to say all this. And also to the Gobeshina um, organizers who every year try, we, we're building up a, a really good community of practice. Also, that's, that's inclusive. So thank you.
Thank you, Chanas, for joining us and saying it as it is. I think that that uh, what you're hinting at is that, you know, we're basically taking what is a faulty system and trying to make it work in an emergency. And what we need is not a retrofitting, but really a complete paradigm change there, right? The money has to go down to the communities. It's not the communities that need to build their capacity to be able to access funds that have, as Constance mentioned, really unrealistic expectations, right? And, yeah. and I mean, to be honest, I don't think that we've quite gotten to that point where it's up to communities to decide whether they focus on rights or whether they focus on uh, what sort of activities they focus on, because I can't, well, there are very, very few examples out there, actually, and, and there are so few and far between that actually give those kind of uh, decision making rights to communities. We're very far away from that situation, I think. Yeah. And, and I don't know to what extent just fiddling with the current system is going to cut it. <laughs> I mean, I think that that we and, and unfortunately, I think also the, the existing systems, there are so many inbuilt incentives to maintain it that that I think that it's it's not going to be easy to change. Right. So it, it needs a very deliberate and and very deep change globally, nationally as well and locally. Right. So yeah. it, it, even I mean, I would say down to the way NGOs function. We, we we shouldn't sort of count ourselves out of that accountability, right? So I'd like to invite our uh, contributors to come back again if they'd like to add, but also I don't see any questions in the in the chat. Would anybody else want to speak? Andrew, maybe I was a bit too daggett for my <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, that should get people to come and want to I contradict. But no, it looks like everybody agrees with you here. So if there are no further questions, uh, Vincent's here. Vincent, I'm going to ask you to come and speak this time. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Andrew. I'll, I'll do that. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you clearly. I'll just yeah. check if my video is working or not, because I'm getting, I sometimes get a funny angle on my video when I'm putting my camera on. Um, Let's see. Can you see me? Yes, you can. Wonderful. OK, great. Well, it's great to be here. It's great to see familiar faces as well. And it's always wonderful to get the sort of range of experiences from from frontline practitioners. And it really helps us as donors to kind of dip, really see this and what, what we're doing in principle what it means in practice and where we're not reaching, where, you know, where we're making commitments to reach. And I think Shanaz was absolutely spot on. I mean, you know, I accept those challenges. She's afraid her challenges were too direct. We need those sort of direct challenges because we're making assumptions about the way that we design programs, we deliver programs, and how those programs are then going to be picked up by the national governments that have made commitments like getting 70% of climate, climate finance local level. Uh, and you know, we, we, we're being asked to um, trust more, you know, lo national governments, local governments, and step back as donors and not be so demanding, not be so prescriptive, not be so top down. So we're trying to do all of that and we're working our way through that. But then that means that we've got expectations on delivery. So Shanaz is saying, you know, yeah, you know, Build, you know, give us trust in in at local level. Give the money and let the decision making happen at local level. How that's used, we're trying to do that. But then Constance comes back with really sort of desperately despairing stories about what's happening in her communities in Uganda, saying, "Well, you know, we're not seeing any of this. You know, we're we're, we're struggling. We're struggling terribly. You know, with the impacts of climate change, but we're not seeing yet how this is actually being realised in practice. So we've got a real sort of you know, dilemma as a donor that we're, we're, we're trying to change the game plan in how we work, but we recognize that by sitting back as a donor and then saying, you know, countries, LDC countries have asked us to believe in them, to trust them. We've got to trust that that's actually going to happen, actually going to happen on the ground. And there's lessons about two way accountability about you know ex less about expectations about transparency and accountability coming up to us from the grassroots but about accountability down the chain as well and that's for us as donors but it's also accountability of national and local governments to deliver what they said they're going to deliver and i think we, we we're still waiting to see that actually happen in practice uh, and you know um, this is a long-term process and it's not going to solve the short-term problems of people like constance and other other colleagues from coming from kenya and, and 
and Vanuatu as well, who are facing immediate problems. You know, and it's easy for me to say, be patient. But I mean, it is a process underway. We are changing. We are wanting to move in new directions. And I really appreciate, again, hearing those stories. It helps, it helps to make it real for us. So thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk as well, Andrew. Thanks, Winston. Thanks a lot. Shenaz, I don't know if you want to come back, but I mean, I'd, I'd just like to say that absolutely, as you say, it's, it's going to change. Uh, take time to change over period, right? I mean, for too long, we've just completely ignored uh, building the capacity of national governments to deliver to local needs and of those local governments as well. So I think that it's going to take time. But also, it's a question of volume, isn't it? No matter how efficient the systems, the amount of money to go that uh, goes down to these um, uh, kind of initiatives is going to be quite low over time. So I don't know to what extent that sorts the problem. But Chenas, do you want to come in as well? Um, Andrew, I'd like to give other people a chance also, because I think this is quite a complex. And as Vincent said, there's a huge trust deficit. But then on the other hand, you have national governments trying to get money, so they report in a positive way. So I think there's lots of these competing priorities and issues, which makes it a complex system. And the only way is to try something and look at what the outcome was. And if it's not desired, you try something else. Because yeah. that's how complex embedded systems work. So there's no one answer, but the willingness to try and experiment, I think, is what is needed. And this um, building trust. So where we, we don't go in to a funding conversation as a, okay, we're not a donor, but as a donor with a trust deficit. Yeah. And then the community, et cetera, has to prove everything, has to show you all sorts of things till you feel comfortable as the donor that there's some sort of trust. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So unless we have any other comments and suggestions, we'll stop there.